Mexico is a country where every day people fight to live. All too often, they lose that battle. A magnificent, heartbreakingly beautiful country with music and food and a uniquely Mexican, darkly funny, deeply felt worldview. Right down there, cuddled up beneath us, our brother from another mother. I took a walk through this beautiful world. Felt the cool rain on my shoulder. Holy Mother of Santa Muerte, please protect my stash of cocaine. Let it not be interfered with by the cops or the competition. Let any who would mess with me be killed. My enemies destroyed. Please forgive us our sins, for they are many. So, is business good? I mean, is there, are there more murders, particularly narco murders? Va en ascenso, va en aumento. La gente opta o por poner un comercio o por vender droga, porque la droga te reditúa dinero muy rápido. ¿no? Entonces eh, va a haber y va a ir incrementando, ¿no? La cantidad de muertes este, relacionadas con esto. ¿no? Every day. Mexico wakes up to count the dead. They are, after all, left out to be seen. Often with a helpful note, identifying who done what, and generally speaking, why. There is a language to the never-ending violence, a coded message in the twists and marks of the bodies. And Valente Rosas is one of the many documenting them for the press. This is what he does every night. Rides around waiting for a phone call or a radio message telling him that there's another one. So, who's buying drugs? Who's selling drugs to who? Antes se se importaba gran cantidad de se llevaba gran cantidad de droga a Estados Unidos, pero ya hay tanto consumo nacional que ya también una parte importante de esa droga se queda en México. Pero bueno, a diferencia de Estados Unidos todavía estamos Bien, por llamarle así, ¿no? Ya ves que en Estados Unidos, eh, puta, hay cada loco que se agarra a matar gente y cosas así, está, está grueso, ¿no? Here you kill each other for a reason. It's business? Sí. More Mexican civilians have been killed since 2006 than all the American military lost in 10 years of the Vietnam War and eight years of wars in Iraq. What do you do if you're one of these cops? You're driving around one night, you see some guy outside of a bar beating somebody or disturbing the peace. You start to arrest him, and he's got a diamond-studded pistol. It's got his name on it. Now you realize you've just arrested somebody with serious, powerful connections. What do you do? Lo dejan libre, no? You let him go. Like, sí. Why do they always pull their pants down? Our local fixer, Alex, is here to translate. In this case, he thinks that they pull the pants down, so to check out more weapons. They're loading him into the sheet. This is the CSI team. So when they were pulling his pants off, money and jewelry started falling from the pockets. Basically, they took the money out of his pockets, and that was the only available spot. To show that they didn't take anything. Yeah, exactly. 
So this is also a drug dealer. The thing here in Mexico is as soon as someone is killed, normally they get candles uh, just right next to it. Sometimes Santa Muerte is related to drug dealings and criminals. How long have you been doing this? About nine years. How many bodies do you think? <laughs> no lo sé. <laughs> Hundreds? Sí, quizá. How do you push them out of your mind when you're not working? A lot of people ask him about this, but uh, he said, like, it's a job. Not like any other kind of job, but uh, as soon as he gets home, he just takes this cover off and just keep living. Well, that's a terrible picture. It's just uh, that's sad what happened here. There was an, an elephant called Hilda. She ran away from a circus, so she basically was crossing the highway and a big bus just ran over it. The world we live in now, of all of these pictures, this is the one that would get people most upset. You'd get the most mail, the most, oh my God, you know, what, what kind of a world do we live in? This was probably the most viewed picture from different media around the world. 80,000 Mexicans have died in the last, seven, what, seven years in yeah. narco violence? Yeah. And this is the most important picture. As our crew gets ready to crawl back to our hotel, Valente gets the call we thought we'd been waiting for. One dead male, shot in head. A note pinned to his chest. In Mexico, people fight to live every day. One man stands alone, facing another man. His intent, to beat his opponent with his fists until he can resist no more. A match, yes, but more accurately, a fight. Jorge La Sierra is a former Bantamweight title holder. With his father, Jorge Sr., and his son Alexis, he trains aspiring fighters in this gym in the Santa Anita neighborhood of Mexico City. He knows that these young men, like generations of boxers everywhere from other neighborhoods like this, are looking for a way out. In Mexico City, boxing is kind of like saver life. You know what I mean? Boxing, they give them like a little discipline. Let's say you're good, but you're not that good. Can you make a living just being a contender? No, but a lot of fighters, they try to make it. Tons of boxers, they want to be a champion. So everybody wants to be a champion? Everybody. Everybody wants to get for the, for the big shot, but you know, you just won. Those are bad odds. The history of boxing is not uh, kind. I mean, most managers and promoters, they don't really give a shit about the fighters. They don't. They use them up, but at the end, they leave a guy all broken down, no money, and scrambles brains. We just like a, like a prostitutes, you know what I mean? In this area, what are your options? If you drop out of high school? Nothing, it's just like being on the street, snatching, you know, robbing, and a lot of kids in the hood, they're gonna say, hey, let's go kidnap that guy. Big industry. Everybody here now wants to be a soccer player or a boxer, because they make money here. Who's got a longer career, a narco or a boxer? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Might be 50-50. I mean, narco, you can last longer. You can. You know, you be protected by the police. You just paid off. Nobody's going to touch you. Expensive protein shakes and dietary supplements, not so much. Boxers here eat what they can afford. The food here is good and, and it's cheap. You know, in Mexico, there's no middle class here. You're either poor or you're really, really rich. I mean, it's a crazy thing. The minimum wage in here is like 50, 60 pesos, which is like a five bucks. Not an hour, a day. But on the other hand, that's why Mexican fighters are so exciting. They're hungry. Exactly. We're hungry.
Tapito is a city within a city, its own thing, either the dark center or the beating heart of Mexico City, depending on your point of view. It's the home of Santa Muerte, the skeletal Saint Death. This is where they come, the impoverished, the oppressed, the marginalized, the criminal. People for whom the traditional church has less relevancy. For the unforgiven and the unforgivable, for those on whom the Catholic saints have turned their backs, there is Santa Muerte. This is a place, and Santa Muerte is a saint that accepts everybody. Death to my enemies written on a votive candle. Let's face it, we've all prayed for that at one point or another. <laughs> Tapito is a poor neighborhood for sure, and a tough one. A center of commerce, both above board and not. <laughs> but perhaps a breakfast beverage first, a michelada. One giant beer with lemon, chili powder, salt, and magi sauce. It's a sizable uh, morning beverage. My companion, blogger, and chronicler of the city, Jorge Pedro. <laughs> wow, a whole season of The Walking Dead for 25 cents. <laughs> you want to buy something? Tapito's got it. Looking for some cheap underwear? Pirated copies of Man vs. Food seasons one through five? This is where you find them. So this all seems very wholesome. I mean, you know, where could I buy a gun, some heroin, and a prostitute? I was looking forward to that. It's, uh... Let's say that Tepito has many layers. Right. And we are in the surface. OK. We are among uh, movies, clothing, families. But I don't think it's as easy as to be candid to ask, uh, where can I get a gun? Probably they will kill you if you ask that. <laughs> You know San Juditas? San Juditas, no? Patron saint of? Hopeless cases. Ah, lost causes. It's become very popular in the last years. A lot of good smells here, man. <laughs> yeah, a lot of good looking food. My happy place is somewhere in here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, we're already here, migas. Beautiful. La Guera. Wherever there's bones and guts simmering in broth, chances are I'll be happy. Writer, sociologist, and lifelong resident of Tepito, Alfonso Hernandez, apparently feels the same way. So this is supposed to be a bad neighborhood. This is the best. I love this neighborhood. It is known for being the Lost Souls neighborhood. It is called Angeles Neighborhood, like angels right. being there. But in Tepito, there are no angels, but lost souls. What's the saying? Comer bien. Eat well. Coger fuerte. And, and showing uh, los huevos to the death. Your Show balls. your balls to the devil or to, to, to the death? <laughs> On the menu, migas. The base comes from boiling cracked ham bones to release the marrow to which garlic, onion, cascabel peppers, and epazote is added. Oh. Thickened with stale bread and leftover tortillas. You got nothing. You make something really awesome out of nothing. The grandmothers had the creativity to take in advantage of the bones of the pigs. And now it's a gourmet dish. Any great old culture where there's poverty, there's something like this. Yeah, by the way, if you're watching this, after you do this, you really got to wash your hands before you touch your, OK? That's a rookie mistake going to take a piss right after. <laughs> She's asking you if you uh, like the migas, if you enjoy it. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Delicious. So these guys have been open for about 65 years. All the members of the crew are relative. Is there hope for social change in this country? Unfortunately, Mexico has become the Tepito of the world. Tepito is still the synthesis of the Mexican. Not a lot of upward mobility here. 
The rich get richer, the poor get ground slowly under the wheel. Eduardo Garcia has hacked his way up the ladder to become chef, owner of the city's hottest restaurant. I grew up in the States. I was a migrant worker picking fruits and vegetables as a kid. My parents didn't earn a lot of money, so I decided to work rather than go to school. The restaurant business, as I well know, ain't no picnic. And in Mexico City, it's particularly rough. Mexico has a reputation where we all know that the country is run by corrupt politics. You have to stand up for what you believe. If you don't, people will run you over. You won't last a minute. I don't let people bully me around. Garcia runs Maximo Bistro with his wife, Gabriela. Here's the kind of extra helping of crap you gotta deal with if you run the hottest restaurant in Mexico City. In 2013, the spoiled daughter of the head of Mexico's Consumer Protection Agency walks in and demands a table when there's unsurprisingly no table available. When Garcia says, sorry, no can do, she pulls a you know who I am and then calls daddy and gets the health inspectors in to shut the place down. So your other customers basically started taking pictures of them with their cell phones. Next thing you know, we have the media outside, and this is Friday. Right. Sunday morning, we're front page of one of the most important newspapers in Mexico. Well, it was very embarrassing to the government. It, and it should be. Because they got caught doing what they do all the time. But if you were not the hottest restaurant in town, if you were just running a cantina, you know, a few blocks away. I would have been. They would have closed you down, and that's that. Right now, a defiant, young, creative generation of Mexican chefs like Eduardo are performing some of the most exciting new cooking anywhere on Earth. A mixing of the very old and traditional with the very new. So you went to La Bordera? Uh, as a kid, yes. Right. One of the jokes throughout the whole time that I worked is, uh, how old are you? I'm, like, I'm 18. You've been 18 for three years. <laughs> Those are abalone from Baja. Yeah, I told you I love butter. I use it even for some Mexican dishes, and then just some roasted chile serrano just to give it a nice little kick for me. They're finished with lemon and, of course, brown butter. Beautiful. Mmm. Very delicious. Very Mexican, very French. Brown butter, <laughs> it's awesome. Makes everything better. Of course. I think the most important thing about Mexican cuisine in general, if it's traditional, it's the ingredients. Confit of suckling pig topped with grandma's salsa. An instant classic. How about it? No, you do it like the Mexican way. Pick it up and go. Wow. Pretty hard to imagine anything better than that. Yeah, you're stuck with this dish forever, man. Forever. That are going to be like Mick Jagger, you know, 50 years from now, singing Satisfaction. <laughs> There's no getting away from it, man. This is so good. This is a classic. But even now, with all his success, Garcia is still fighting a struggle most Mexicans are all too familiar with. What happened that day happens every day. And the promise always is, we're going to shut you down. You don't know who I am. And for me, I'd rather close my restaurant than, than live like that. If you close my restaurant, I will go across the street, I will go to another state, or I will go to another country, and I still will make uh, a good restaurant. Under former President Felipe Calderón, Mexico launched a concerted war on drugs, ostensibly against the notorious and seemingly untouchable cartels. Absolutely no one can say with any credibility, by the way, that Mexico's war, or our trillion dollar war, just say no, has had any effect in diminishing the flow of drugs into our country. 
One very brave journalist has uncovered exactly how deep the rot of corruption and dirty money has penetrated into every level of Mexican institutions. My grandmother is from Oaxaca, so how we used to drink the mezcal is never mm -hmm. with lemon, it's with orange. It was not what a lot of people wanted to hear, much less see published. Today, Annabel Hernandez, author of the groundbreaking expose Los Señores del Narco, lives under guard in a secret location. The threat, very, very real and very explicit. Do you think there was ever a minute when the Calderon war on drugs? Yeah. Was it ever genuine? No. Who really start the war against the drug cartels was Vicente Fox. Felipe Calderón just followed that instruction, but he didn't really do anything new. He just did it worst since the beginning. The plan of the government was protect the Sinaloa cartel and fight against the enemies of the Sinaloa cartel. Of the seven major Mexican cartels, the Sinaloa cartel is considered the most powerful with the farthest reaching and most pervasive tentacles extending deep into every corner of government, banking, and private industry. Its rivals, the Tijuana Cartel, the Gulf Cartel, the Juarez Cartel, the Beltran Levia, La Familia Michoacana, and the particularly murderous Los Zetas. The cartels are responsible for importing roughly three quarters of all illegal narcotics to America. In your work, you've uncovered what had to be some very embarrassing and incriminating associations and connections between very high elected officials, the, the presidents uh, and entire administrations and uh, acts of incredible criminality. Um, how did that change your life? Well, when I started to make this investigation of, on 2005, and I really understand that it, it, it would be very dangerous, I have to say that it wasn't really a surprise for me what happened after I published my book. What I didn't expect is that the threats came from the federal government. Annabel says that one of her sources warned her that the biggest threat was from within, that one of the most highly placed, most senior law enforcement officials in Mexico had ordered her killed. Because in my book, I put his name and also show uh, some documents that proves that he was involved, he was in the payroll of the Sinaloa cartel. What happened to this man? Right now, he is very happy drinking rum, I think, building many enterprises, fake enterprises, laundry, his money. To me, the weak link are the bankers. A banker who launders money, he's got a family, he's got a reputation, he gives money to charity, his neighbors think he's great, his kids think he's wonderful. He's got something to lose. So I wouldn't be prosecuting drug dealers, I'd be prosecuting bankers. The name of my book is Los Señores del Narco. Because Los Señores del Narco are not only El Chapo Guzmán and the leaders of the these cartels. No! Los Señores del Narco are also these. Mm -hmm. The politicians as the, and, and, and bankers and the businessmen. The people have to know who are these people, name by name. You've been a journalist for how long? Since, 20, 20 for, years. 20 years. Your father was killed, kidnapped and killed in 2000? My father was a businessman. In that year, uh, many gangs used to kidnap to the businessman just for money. So when we went to the police and asked them to, to investigate, they said, well, if you pay us, we will, we, will, we will make the investigation. So as family, we decide to pay because you cannot buy the justice. Since that, I really try to, to fight against corruption. That's why I'm doing what I do, because I think that corruption is the worst problem in Mexico. The drug cartels are maybe the worst face of that problem, but the problem in, in, in the deep is 
the corruption. The corruption is the mother of all our problems in Mexico. It should be pointed out how, that so 88 journalists, how many journalists have been killed in this country? 90, 90 now. 90 journalists yes. have now have been killed or disappeared over the last few years. Yeah. Here, you can kill a journalist and get away with it. Why are you still here? I have lost many things in my life. My father was the most important person in my life. I already lost everything. I don't have any life anymore. I don't have a social life. I don't have a sentimental life. I don't have anything. I just have my work and my family. And my work of journalists is everything for me. I really believe that good journalists can change the world. I have received many offers to go outside to France, to Sweden, and other countries. I don't want to left. It's my choice. My choice is fight. I came to Oaxaca for mezcal. I like mezcal more and more these days. And this guy, Ron Cooper, finds and sells some of the best mezcal in the world. We're at the Zapotec ruins of Monte Alban. In pre-conquest Mexico, there were gods and goddesses of intoxication and ecstasy. The touch of a lover, the smell of a flower, the aha of an idea, all had gods and goddesses that took responsibility for those things. All of your mezcals come from different villages and yes. only that village. And only one maker in that village. We call our stuff single village mezcal because most mezcals are made with a blend of different villages all put together. No one goes home and has a cocktail in these Indian villages. They wait until there's a special occasion. Every birth, death, confirmation, baptism, there's a fiesta. A wedding is eight days. You invite 200 people. You feed them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You have a band every day. And then they really consume. Don't drink yet. For Mother Earth and our ancestors. And then you say, Stigi Bayo. Stigi Bayo. That's extraordinary. Back in the day, it was cheap stuff with a worm in it, and there were rumors that if you ate the worm, you'd start tripping, that there was oh, yeah. a hallucinogenic yeah, component right. to mezcal. Yeah. Now, is there a particular kind of a high? Is this an enlightening high? Is this a good high? The high is humorous. You have these funny thoughts dancing around the back of your Happy, head. Happy, witty drum. Yes. In Oaxaca, Ancient indigenous traditions and ingredients define not only the mezcal, but also the food. One of the main reasons people visit our city is to eat. This is Alejandro Ruiz Olmedo, one of Mexico's best chefs. He started cooking young. When he was 12, his mother died, and it fell on him to raise and feed his five siblings. But this is what we call tasajo. Today, he draws much of his inspiration from Oaxaca's Central Market. Probably America's most beloved food is what they think is Mexican food. Yes. And I think most Americans' view of Mexican food is like beans, fried tortilla, melted cheese, and some chicken. Yes. In fact, and particularly when we're talking about Oaxaca, this is a deep, really sophisticated cuisine. That's correct. Oaxaca has these different microclimates all over our territory, and that gives us this enormous amount of 
spices, products, fruit, chilies. Like 500,000 varieties of corn, something like yes, that. Yes, correct. Right? I mean, this is really where the good shit grows. Ya estamos aquí. This is stands of barbacoa, and this lady here, oh, it's always like, making like the oh, best. Oh, tender. Yes. Tender, tasty. Mm, man. <laughs> Greens and crunch. Uh, cabbage and cilantro. Buen uh, provecho. Oh, unbelievably good. Mm -hmm. Just so tasty. And they're going to give us some fun for me. Mm. Man, deep. It's good. All right, I'll finish this. <laughs> this is just too damn good. People have this barbecue, especially on Sundays. It's a tradition to have barbacoa. Just so tasty. All this uh, pasillo, it's full of chiles, no? People think that Mexican food has to be necessarily spicy because of oh, the no, chiles no. we use. And, and we go for flavors, not for the spiciness. What most people miss is how really deep and really sophisticated the sauces here can be. Like, Lyon is to France. Yes. Oaxaca is to, to Mexico, in my experience. You're right. Yeah. Also, really? in my experience. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not kissing your ass here. I'm just, that's, I'm just in Lyon. <laughs> This is Vicky's place. She's been cooking up traditional Oaxacan dishes in the market for 30 years. Whoa, that's awesome when he's, so he's cooking the egg right on the kamal. Oh, man. So the guy working the kamal, first of all, a lot of the kamal you see now are metal. That's old school, super old school. That's the way yeah. they did back in uh, Zapotec times, man. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, on the clay uh, kamal. Yes. And I mean, I'm looking up there, he's, he's doing our, our tortillas. Yes. And he's doing, it's one of my favorite things, the zucchini flowers with the yes. string cheese. Oh, that's so pretty to see. Olmedo's cooking, his focus, his passion, have very old, very deep roots. My parents were farmers in a small village like mine. Since you are six, eight, seven, you have a role to develop in the family. Right. So my role was to water the chile plantation, the tomato plantation, to milk the cows, and help my mom while she was making tortillas like that. She would uh, give, give me directions and telling me, okay, roast the chiles, roast the tomatoes. I tell you how to prepare molcajete salsa. So that was at the beginning of my profession, right. cooking, learning from the knowledge of how a tomato should taste like when you cut it directly from the plant. The way it should taste. That's Old right. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Happy. This is what you should do. Try the egg first, like this. Right. Or just grab a, grab a hunk. Here yes. Here. And then put salsa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't been anywhere in Mexico where the cooking is better than here. This is a way to preserve our culture through our food. The quiet little town of Teotitlan del Valle is about 15 miles outside of Oaxaca. The town where the arts crafts and traditions of the pre-Hispanic Mexico are celebrated and packaged for consumption. Abigail Mendoza and her sister Rufina are Zapotecan, original people from Mexico before the Spanish, before the Aztecs. This is her restaurant, where Abigail has been grinding corn by hand, making masa and moles like this, the ridiculously faithful, time-consuming, difficult, traditional way she was taught to make these things, and the way she's been making them since she was six years old. Look at her hands, by the way. Small, surprisingly delicate, given all the hard work, all the pushing, kneading, grinding, stone against stone over the years. Then look at her forearms, the power there. It's impressive and beautiful. Yeah. Every time you enter a house in Oaxaca, especially in the small villages, they always offer you a shot of mezcal. Mm, so good. Següesa, a mole and chicken dish. This mole sauce, like a lot of the real old-school moles made by masters like Abigail, 
uses 35 different types of chili peppers and takes more than two weeks to make. Do you think that until recently, until guys like you, that Mexicans were not looking back at their own food culture, they were looking elsewhere? Uh, what, was, what was going on? We were conquered. We were also a culture that was conquered first by the Aztecs, and then we were conquered by the Spaniards. So we were always told that everything that was good and excellent has to be imported. Right. And what we had here, it was just not good. Right. Another Zapotecan classic, chile agua, a simpler dish of cow and pork brains cooked with chilies, tomatoes, and yerba santa. As a cook, the main thing I learned was to develop a little bit my cuisine here. There was this space where nobody tried to innovate. Still using the same techniques, the same ingredients, the same flavors, herbs, etc. but you know, developing a little bit. Muchas gracias. Sí. Muy amable, gracias. También muy prehispánico. I mean, that's as old school as it gets. This is super ancient. A finer dish than this one, you cannot have. This, this is something that you do not find anywhere else in Mexico. A quiet night in the Zocalo, the central square of Oaxaca. But even tonight, there's plenty of evidence of the struggle, the discontent boiling just under the surface. The graffiti and painting of this street artist who goes by the name Yeska captures that spirit of Oaxacan protest. The Last Supper, for sure. It's the Last Supper, but Mexican Last Supper. Who are these people? It's the most powerful people in Mexico. People that is driving Mexico. This is Peña Nieto, the president right now. Mm -hmm. This is Felipe Calderón, right. the, last president. the last president. And that guy is like the economy guy, right. who is moving the economy in mm -hmm. Mexico. And this is the army. This is a prostitute. It's represent because they are like prostitutes. Right. You know? <laughs> and uh in middle Jesus. this is a narco traffic. Ah, yeah, yeah. The so middle. yeah. He is like the god in Mexico, you know? Because he is like over you know? all of it. Yeah. So this is the way Mexico works. Yeah. For me the most problem in Mexico is the corruption. Mexico can be a dangerous place for journalists, for politicians, for police. Is it a dangerous place for uh, artists? Yeah, I think so, yeah, because if you not agree with the government, right. you are like enemy. In 1936, the town of Cuernavaca, 50 miles from Mexico City, was visited by Malcolm Lowry, a tormented, self-loathing, brilliant, and hopelessly alcoholic author. His life work, Under the Volcano, was set here. It is widely believed to be one of the great novels of the 20th century. Lowry saw symbolism and evil everywhere here. In the deep barrancas, the looming volcano that towered overhead. Writer, poet, Javier Cecilia, one of Cuernavaca's most celebrated residents, has reason to see evil too. On March 28, 2011, Narcos kidnapped and murdered his son, Juan Francisco, and six other equally blameless innocent victims. Cecilia found himself moved to march to Mexico City to demand an end to the increasingly futile so-called war on drugs 
that was mindlessly grinding up so many victims in the crossfire and in the margins. Under the volcano, the evil that's coming is fascism, Nazism. What is the heart of the infernal machine today? Una nueva forma del totalitarismo, que es el dinero y que y la disputa de los territorios para controlar el dinero tanto por parte del Estado como por parte del crimen organizado, que casi son lo mismo en mi país. What does he want to say? What does he want people to hear? ¿Qué es lo que quieres que la gente oiga? Necesitamos detener esta guerra. Es una guerra que nos está matando hijos, hijas, que nos está haciendo perder la democracia, que tiene al país balcanizado y roto, que necesitamos encontrar la paz y la justicia que no tiene este país. Can he think of one place on earth where the good guys are winning? and where you are not ground under the wheels of the machine. Donde la gente pone por encima la vida humana y la relacionalidad amorosa, ahí está, ahí está una sociedad, ahí está en el centro del horror, la vida y la paz. Donde hay unos seres que se niegan a aceptar la muerte, se niegan a aceptar que se sigan matando, que sigan arrojando cuerpos en las calles decapitados, donde hay una sociedad que puede decir está el ser humano por encima de cualquier cosa, ahí está la vida, ahí hay un buen lugar. Have you written a poem since the death of your son? No, escribí un último poema cuando supe del asesinato de Juan Francisco, de mi hijo, y con ese cerré mi Mi actividad como poeta escribe poemas. As I have come to know in my own life, drugs, even drug addiction, can be a survivable event. Death is not. Death is final.